Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our World Potato uh, webinar. My name is Ekaterina from uh, Easy Fresh. I'm uh, organization coordinator, and we would like to thank uh, uh, Global Potato Congress for this great opportunity to participate in this webinar and share with you our knowledge in uh, perishable shipping in logistics. Um, as in the next slide, um, uh, we are welcome you to attend the 2024 World Potato Congress in uh, Adelaide in Australia, which will be in June 23rd uh, to 26th. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we want to thank our um, uh, World Potato Congress sustaining partners for the, their support uh, of the World Potato Congress and uh, to provide opportunities such as webinars to encourage networking uh, in the global potato industry. Uh, the next slide uh, uh, we will present um, today's webinar, uh, which name is International Transport and the Global Potato Value Chain. This webinar will be presented by my EasyFresh colleagues, uh, Gavin Sherwin, who is Managing Director of EasyFresh Ireland, Rafael Yarena, CEO EasyFresh, and myself uh, um, in Spain. And the next slide, uh, we will introduce you about EasyFresh, what are we doing, our organization. Uh, we are global refill logistics suppliers. Uh, we have our own offices in Spain, the Netherlands, Ireland, Chile, and Egypt. We offer um, a logistics for the temperature controlled environment. And we cover 2020 countries and territories with refill specialized uh, experts. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we will talk about global container shipping demand outlook. Uh, for 2022, Drury Reports uh, has downgraded the port handling outlook to 1.5%. Previously, it was 2.3%. Uh, outlook for 2023 has also lowered by 1.9% and from 2.9%. Uh, before. A significant risk uh, that economists uh, are yet to fully grasp scale is, of course, a uh, volatile environment, making further downgrades probable. Uh, but people will prioritize the basic, and food stuff is always the basic. Uh, and the next slide, uh, we will look into seaborne refill trade, uh, which will expand uh, to 3% of compound annual growth to 2026. Uh, the last 10 years, seaborne reef traffic grew by 3%. Meat remains the main commodity, which uh, has 22% of trade, followed by bananas uh, with 15% uh, and fish uh, with 13%. Uh, the year 2022, seaborne growth revised down to 1%. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we will look into worldwide perishable cargo model split focus. As if uh, cargo growth slows to 3% compound annual growth rate to 2026, it is now expected that containers will pass the 90% of their hold in 2025. Juice tankers, which is an ultra niche uh, refill mode, has proved that well, uh, well long term supply chains can be excellent alternatives to volatile carrier controlled options. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we will look into specialized refer rates, uh, which has peaked and short term positive. Specialized refer rates um, have enjoyed a revival as they plug the shortcomings of the container carriers. Uh, rates peaked in first quarter 2022, but have held up well since. A decline in pricing is anticipated next year and beyond as supply constraint is. In the next slide, we will see the seaborne trade by commodity group. Worldwide refill volumes are estimated to have reached 297 million tons. Seaborne trade accounts for 46% of all perishable trade on a worldwide basis. Bananas remains the commodity which is proportionally mostly carried by sea. As per global trade, potato total refer trade is about 10 million, which is more uh, than juice, uh, which you can see as in this graphic. In the next slide, uh, we will see the uh, conclusion. So, uh, seaborne refer trade recovered in 2021, uh, but has slowed into 2022. 
a year in which equipment growth at a standstill and all the equipment gets removed from the fleet, container imbalance remains a uh, constant, but reposition easier uh, as alternative costs lower and refer container freight rates have peaked. And from the next slide, uh, we will do a little bit of common. So container refer uh, to expand 3.7% of compound annual growth rate. Uh, container refer traffic um, uh, continues to expand at a faster pace than the overall refer trade. Uh, containerized volumes are expected to surprise 6 million uh, by 2024. In the next slide, uh, we will look into refer container imbalances. As you know, Southern Hemisphere imbalances are a feature of the refer shipping business, but as the pressure on a dry cargo shipping eases, so does the repositioning of refer containers becomes easier. Asia remains the area which needs to evacuate equipment to demand regions. Europe has become again a surplus area for refer containers as shipments of protein to Asia have diminished. In the next slide, we will see that there is no growth in overall refer container equipment fleet in 2022. A record production of refrigerated container in 2021, partly due to front loaded orders for equipment with traditional paints and primers. Production in 2022 is expected to reach just over 200,002 and retirement of all the equipment as supply chain normalized. And uh, this is a we look into shipping, uh, logistics trends. And now my colleague Rafael Yelena, who is always fresh, uh, will make uh, some comments on this thing. Good afternoon, good day to everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Rafael Yerena. I'm a colleague of Ekaterina sitting next door, same office with her here in Spain. Uh, I will say a few words about what she basically presented and, and before my other colleague, Gavin Sherwin, MD for Issues Island. Um, uh, so let me just comment briefly. Uh, I mean, you all, I mean, if you are on the producing side, on the receiving side of the potato chain and potato logistics chain. Uh, I mean, you have been suffering and going through different experiences, and some of them not very good in the last couple of years. Uh, not only the start of the pandemic where there was, uh, as you may know, uh, as you will remember, uh, well, a decrease in the general demand of cargo, uh, uh, with some exceptions, but of course there was uh, overall, a 30% decrease of, of cargo movements globally, meaning that, that okay, the shipping lines, especially those who, who operate the big container ships, uh, decided to drop uh, the fleet, and but realized for the first time ever that, uh, uh, well, there was, regardless of this situation where there was less cargo to carry, they were doing more money because they were able to increase sea freights. This was uh, a very strange situation where the service was bad uh, and, and okay, they were doing all, all, all the service standards were lower, let's put it that way, and the sea freights went up and they were uh, in a way by means of reducing capacity, or transport capacity to, to um, make more money. Uh, this uh, well lasted for a while. Uh, uh, even it was in a way worse at the moment we had the, the boom or the rebound of the cargo after the pandemic or after let's call it the, the lockdowns that we had. Uh, I'm talking a little bit in the last during the last couple of years. So that, that moment was especially, as you all will remember, complicated for everyone, whereby sea freight skyrocketed. Uh, there was no space, there was a boom of cargo. Remember that uh, reefer cargo uh, or temperature cargo to be carried under temperature control, it's always very dependent, with some exception of some specific legs, very dependent on the evolution of the dry cargo, which is really the, the main driver of, of uh, the business on the shipping and logistics side, because the volumes simply are much higher. 
And and okay, I mean that big bank on on, on cargo demand, I mean, uh, created a, a big uh, suffering to probably many of you, to us as logisticians, trying to find solutions for for you in a in a moment where there was no space in the ships, there was no, um, there were congestions uh, because of the lockdowns in the ports, and remember there were measures that lasted very long. Imagine a truck going into a gate into a port and uh, drivers had to, because of the uh, COVID situation, they had to split uh, the, the lanes. And, and I mean, there were so many measures in, uh, in every specific port and, and, and hub that, uh, well, the bottlenecks were multiplied by X. And, and so we were in a kind of uh, drama where everybody was asking for space in the ships. And there was no space. I mean, and 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 it was a very complex situation. That uh, with the time during this year, during present year, has been easing uh, because that big boom of uh, volume of cargo demand uh, slowed down. Uh, there there were cases, very clear cases. For example, in the states, in the west coast, where the ships were were waiting for a long time. Well, okay, this has uh, only yeah three weeks ago. I would say. I mean, there was. The confirmation of that situation had stopped, or there was, so to say, back to normal, but had been shifted to the East Coast. Okay, there has been a process whereby the situation has has improved, uh, talking on space availability, on solutions. Uh, but we have learned, we all have learned that that well, these things may happen and will happen in a way or the other, with pandemic or without pandemic, because we have to take in consideration talking. As Katarina would say, that the uh, well, the amount of of uh, containerized cargo is growing, meaning that 90% of the seaborne trade is in containers, but only five to ten players, well, with the maximum ten players, control 60% of the of the of the whole capacity in line. So it's a handful, practically a handful of people. Who can, in an uh, oligopolistic way, decide what to do? We are now facing a situation where, which is very interesting. Uh, there's, in some countries, we have some recessions, cargoes are dropping. Uh, we are seeing some blank sailings. We are seeing, likewise, um, the lockdowns in China are easing, but the lines are starting to take measures like slow steaming, like instead of going through Suez Canal, turning uh, through South Africa up to Europe, if we talk Asia to Europe or Asia to America, I mean, depending on, on the leg, but taking more time on uh, and burning less fuel because it's more expensive, as you all know, when you check your cards. Uh, uh, what I mean is that the carriers are taking measures um, in a soft way uh, um, that lead to reduce the capacity in the market, not as they did in the, in the beginning of the pandemic and so on, uh, as I just mentioned, but uh, of course, as a reaction to the existing situation to monitor the capacity and, and allow the freights to stop falling. As you know, you all have seen, if you have been paying freights lately, you have seen the freights have reduced because of this situation where, okay, there's more capacity or there has been more capacity in the market. So what I would like to do and take the liberty to make a couple of advices just to finish this uh, little comment is that try to program your loadings and your bookings. I know it's easy to say and not always is exactly feasible, but if you come to a shipping line or to a logistic, a 3PL uh, a supplier like we are uh, with the program, it's easier to negotiate and with the different suppliers, being a shipping line, a trucking company, a terminal. I mean, the more planning you incorporate in that before the booking, the better. And the uh, earlier, the better, of course. Um, another thing, uh, open your mind in the sense, uh, sorry that I talk like that, but I take the liberty to, to a little bit advise you that open your mind in other possibilities, uh, other port of loadings, other port of discharge. Uh, sometimes uh, the shortest transit time is not the, you know, on the seaborne side, it's not the shortest total door to door 
if you include the inland hinterland so on the levels and collections it's not maybe the shortest way to do you know in the adriatic uh, you have ports like copper and trieste uh, where for example copper works on the weekends this is more potato oriented if i may say in a way but more specialized in potatoes but but they don't work on the weekend so if the ship is arriving on a friday um, uh, i mean then you won't be able to move the car up to the monday in copper you will be able to do it during the weekend i mean uh, that just as an example i mean open your mind to solutions depending on the detail and for that um, uh, uh, not only us of course but there are many that can advise you properly. And this is the other advice I would <laughs> like to, uh, to put on the table that work with more than one CPL. Not everybody has got a solution for everything. Uh, we can be good here or there. Now we are, for example, um, constructing a, a, a cold store in a Keysight cold store in Murdaic in, in, in Holland. Uh, there we can help, but maybe we cannot help in Philippines, just to put an example. Uh, um, so, uh, open your mind and try to talk to various suppliers. It has been traditional, and, and, and this is not new for, for many of you, that you rely on somebody which is, uh, you have a strong relationship, that's good, uh, but um, it's always interesting to hear others. Like when you go to the doctor and, and you have a pain here or there, maybe you want a second opinion. That's, that's what I want to transmit, because in logistics, we are going into a world of uncertainties you know there is a number of new sources a uh, number of of uh, new commodities um, even in in your world you have varieties that, that seasons you have the dynamics change so dramatically quickly i mean there's a war there is a disease there is whatever and this changes the traffic flow so in these uncertainties i mean uh, and it's very important that you have trust to, with your uh, logistic suppliers, more than one, as I said, which is the, the, uh, the comment I made before. And, and I'm happy to, to support you whenever you need. So after the session, the session today, and of course, uh, the end of the session with a QA and, and over the email, we will be at your disposal anytime. So I pass the word to my colleague, Gavin, in Ireland. Hello, Gavin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, good morning, um, and perhaps good evening in some places. Um, um, delighted to be part of today's webinar. Um, I initially want to thank um, Ekaterina and thank Raphael for their presentations preceding me. Um, of course, want to extend the thanks out to the WPC for um, giving us this forum um, to present the webinar today. Um, so just about me, I'll give a brief introduction before I get into my presentation. Um, I am the General Manager of Easy Fresh Ireland, um, joined in April 2021. Um, I've got over 15 years experience in the fruit and vegetable uh, supply chain, um, import exports um, from Ireland, obviously predominantly. Um, I initially came into, I guess, the FMCG side of things and the fruit and veg supply chain from a finance perspective and gradually went through then and have ended up on the other spectrum of the logistics and the supply chain operations, uh, which some way might say is a little bit crazy, but um, it's certainly a crazy and hectic world, which I very much enjoy. Um, so just to, to step on, I'll share um, my presentation now with you guys. Um, and it's essentially um, just to do with my attendance, uh, I guess a board's eye view, a personal view um, and an opinion on the Congress that took place in Dublin earlier this year. So, of course, it's the 11th, uh, the 11th World Potato Congress, um, a year delayed, of course, by by COVID. Um, if you bear with me one second now, and I'll share the screen. So I trust that you can all you can all see this now at the moment. Um, so, yeah, of course, I said uh, back to I, I started with Easy Fresh in April 2021, and I believe the Congress was originally penciled in for 2021. Um, in some ways, um, it's difficult to perhaps be happy with some circumstances of COVID, but in this case, um, I was thankful that the Congress was was delayed by a year until 2022 because, of course, allowed my attendance. Um, so it, it was an absolute privilege to represent Easy Fresh um, and Easy Fresh Ireland. Um, so again, thank you to Raphael and the guys who who trust and trusted me 
and my colleagues to 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 attend. Um, again, yeah. So the the WPC, we, I think the tenth Congress um, uh, took place in Peru prior to prior to Ireland. So of course, Peru, as we all know, the origins of the of the potato. Um, so we probably had a lot to live up to. And as I said, a great privilege, a great honour that Ireland was chosen. Um, being an Irishman and being a fellow Dubliner, um, yeah, an absolute honour that it was chosen um, and took place in, in, in Dublin in, in May through early June 2022. Um, so just, I guess, the slides here as I take you through um, are some personal photos which I took um, across the days that, I, that myself and a colleague spent, spent on site. So of course, the pictures here detail... Um, I guess the, the, the beautiful surrounds, the beautiful uh, surrounds and historic surrounds of the RDS in Dublin, uh, which is the which is the facility and the site where everything took place. Um, an absolutely extensive um, and packed program was was put together um, that catered for absolutely everything. Um, I'm sure, um, probably perhaps catered for perhaps too much um, because I, I regrettably wasn't able to attend everything, even though we would have liked to. Um, so I'm sure there was absolutely something included in the program for everybody across the plenary sessions, the speakers and the dignitaries, um, to the focus sessions. Of course, the exhibition hall itself with the exhibitors and their stands, which will follow into the into the next into the next slide. Um, so as you can see, the RDS itself, um, the this particular hall, um, iconic and historic, so beautiful surrounds to to for the exhibition to take place. Um, obviously the poster sessions um, and then of course the, as I said the plenary sessions and the speakers that took place in the concert hall um, multiple tours and excursions um, to, to various famous tour spots were also part of the program um, and indeed of course then the social events across a fun run, the, the golf day and of course the evening events that took place um, from the opening ceremony um, to the barbecue and then, of course, to the to, to the Congress social evening on the Wednesday evening at the Guinness Storehouse. So essentially myself and a colleague, Antonio, spent the full day uh, Tuesday and the full day Wednesday in the exhibition hall um, just to savour um, and sample the atmosphere, um, which I have to say the picture here doesn't depict it because I think everybody was in the everybody here was in the concert hall at the time. Um, a very busy morning indeed, though. Um, so of course, um, just some various pictures then taken of the of, of the exhibition hall itself. As I said, we savoured and attended. Went to a number of the number of the exhibitors, many of whom I know again uh, quite well. Uh, brand names and uh, traditional family-owned companies um, here in Ireland, and um, that I know well from my time in my fifteen years of of, of fruit and vegetables. Um, so lend itself very well. So a couple of faces that I haven't seen um, in, in a number of years and indeed certainly hadn't seen pre-COVID times. So um, all in all, it was just an excellent experience to be there, as I said, to savour the environment, savour the atmosphere. Um, in particular, um, especially taking some of the, the complimentary snacks of crisps that were available um, and cheekily taking, um, partaking in some of the gin sampling and the whiskey sampling, of course. So they say, when in Rome. Um, so I'll just take you through here. Obviously, the slide here is the key sponsors that essentially made it all happen, uh, made the Congress happen. So uh, a big thank you to everyone here uh, who made the contributions and put their energies and efforts into making the Congress um, and getting it started, getting it going in, in, in May through June. Um, this is just a layout of the exhibition hall itself. And of course, a lot of the exhibitors that were, were based, many of them uh, domestic Irish companies, of course, many of them um many, many of them from further afield which was a great experience to be amongst um just then the, the schedule across tuesday across wednesday um so you can see as i said a packed schedule something for absolutely everybody uh whether it was educational whether it was uh, social whether it was light-hearted something in it for everybody um okay i guess the, I'll again add here that it's, it's an honour, I guess, uh, to represent Easy Fresh um, and Easy Fresh Ireland at the Congress. Um, obviously, being a silver partner, as we can see here. Um, yeah, just absolutely great to be amongst everybody here um, to, to play our part in supporting um, the Potato Congress and indeed the Potato Worldwide. Um, this one here in particular caught my eye. Um, because I think um, Raphael just mentioned this, we have a state-of-the-art 
cold store, Keyside cold store now, just um, uh, work in progress, some of it operational and still to come online in Mordike in the Netherlands. So again, a key aspect of what we can offer, particularly on the continent, is cold storage. Um, so it's just an item that stood out uh, as fairly relevant um, from, from our side, from the Easy Fresh side of expertise. Um, as I said, absolutely sampling, savouring the atmosphere. Um, this lady here, of course, in, 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 in the national dress, um, I believe, obviously, of course, coming in from Peru, caught the eye. Um, it was absolutely terrific to see um, many people from many different corners of the globe attending in Dublin um, for the Congress. Um, it's just, again, an absolute privilege to be amongst it. Um, I'll get into the highlights then, I guess, myself, um, particular highlights. Um, as I said, it, it was an absolutely packed program. Um, I myself then, as I said, spent time in the exhibition hall across two days. Um, myself and my wife attended the barbecue in the Clayton Hotel, um, which, was a, which was a great evening. Um, I, I certainly got the sense that everybody was able to let their hair down and enjoy. Um, even if, though, it's, of course, it's a professional environment to, to, to some degree, but a lot of people, obviously, with, with, on the back of COVID, wouldn't, it would have been a long time since we were able to be together and share and, and enjoy um um amongst each other in an environment like that so i think it certainly got the sense on that evening uh, at the barbecue um that there was uh, there was a lot of joy for everybody to actually meet face to face and be together again um this here picture here then uh, particularly was was probably my my main highlight i think from the um from our attendance um obviously being easy fresh being a sustaining partner we were invited to the sustaining partner breakfast so um at least it was laid on where we, we met i was amongst in the room amongst um the other representatives of the key um sustaining partners and of course the directors of uh the, the board of directors of the wpc and other dignitaries um so again i think that for me at least that that um wednesday morning was an absolute highlight to be able to be there to represent not just easy fresh but to represent ireland to represent dublin um definitely a great pleasure um, of course, you can't move on without saying anything about the, the goodie bags that were supplied. Um, so I believe I still have this bag now at home myself and still utilize it. Um, I think if anybody was in attendance, they know that there was a rain mac um, included in this bag internally. Um, but thankfully, the weather, I think, if I can recall, the weather laid, uh, played a great hand in, in assisting us. Um, the, the weather, at least for the right throughout the week, was was very was very good indeed. Um, I guess unusual for Ireland in some ways, um, but at least lent itself to again a great a, a great atmosphere and a, and a great week for everybody who was in atten in, in attendance. So we'll move on again. One of the other um, highlights for me was of course the closing ceremony, and this picture here is the is the infamous uh, the, the famous concert hall um, of the RDS, where a lot of the plenary sessions and the speakers took place throughout the week. This here specifically was the closing ceremony. Um, Mr. Tom Arnold, um, uh, was, was, it was his speech at the time uh, where he spoke about some of the, the culture, the historic culture and some of the things that make Ireland, I guess, globally recognised. So in this particular picture, it was uh, a poem from Mr. Patrick Kavanagh. Um, so the, again, the literature, the music, the arts of Ireland, um, all strong elements of, of our culture that we were able to share with everyone. Um, but of course, I actually think that the potato is, 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 of course, absolutely synonymous with Ireland too, um, for 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 both good and bad. Of course, some tragedy um, from the famine times, but it's led us to today to where it's it's embedded in our culture. It's a staple of our diet still, um, just like music, just like literature is embedded in our culture, and of course means a lot to the, the greater diaspora globally. Um, and indeed, I hope many of the attendees that were in place. Um, may well have had Irish roots, and I hope you got the opportunity to explore that while you were here. So we go from Tom to the Declaration of Dublin, um, and Mr. Romain Coules, um, who now I know is happily retired, I believe, after after uh, after a long stint and 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 a brilliant stint as the as the head of the WPC. So the Declaration of Dublin, in, in particular, leading to the closing ceremony. Um, this slide here, in particular. I think looking forward into the future was was one key thing that jumped out for me uh, with the projections of the population to hit near on 10 billion um, within three decades. But the need for 70 percent more food, it just hit home that particularly in Ireland and the potato being a staple of our diet for so long, 
um, it just hit home that's just how important the potato is globally and to other regions and developing regions and just how important it is that again all of the efforts all of the energies that have been put in um, through various channels of course with the, the true uh, with the guidance of the WPC and all its sponsors and all its supporters um, just goes to show how important the potato is for for the future um, here then we're just going to jump to again I guess one last I guess particular highlight um, was the social evening in the Guinness storehouse um, I have a number of pictures from that evening but this is probably the best one to share just with the with the harp um, being the national emblem of Ireland um, that was again a a, a, a brilliant uh, a brilliant evening um, in quite a quite a uh, suitable spot in the Guinness storehouse because again I guess there's two things that people associate um, at the top of a list with Ireland it would be the potato and it would indeed be Guinness so um, they're as famous as each other and, and as relevant and as important to Ireland as each other. Um, and then I'll just bring it to the final picture. Um, so I'll just explain at least the technical tours as well as part of the, the, the program. Regrettably, I didn't get a chance to, to, to attend out on one of the visits um, out, to the, out to the farms in either North County Dublin, up to County Meath, up as far as Belfast and indeed down the southeast of the country. Um, which led then to Bloom as well, which is a which is a famous festival again um, that takes place in the Phoenix Park over the June Bank holiday weekend here in Ireland um, every year, COVID permitting. Um, wasn't able to take part of those, but um, I'm sure anybody who was in attendance that made it um, certainly has strong memories uh, and, 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 and a very good experience to take away, take away from that. So yeah, just to say that the, the closing ceremony then, um, where again Romaine and the Dublin Declaration was made. Um, of course, the literal, I'll finish with this at least, the literal handing over of the flag um, was a good process uh, to, to, to see uh, in person, where the flag has been passed to our Australian uh, colleagues, uh, Australian friends for Adelaide in 2024. Um, no doubt, again, if it's anything as well organised and as much energy and effort put in and passion put in, to make it make it a success as the Irish Congress was, no doubt it's going to be an absolutely brilliant place to be. So again, I'd, I'd encourage anybody who can make it to, to to put that date in their diary to attend Adelaide for the twelfth WTC Congress um, in twenty twenty four. One last note, I guess, because I recall it was mentioned um, in the in the speakings and particularly the closing ceremony. Um, I just want to obviously say from my own point of view, uh, congratulations to absolutely everyone. Um, who was involved and invested their energies and the lobbying um, to finally get the International Potato Day recognised. Um, I, I know the news broke in July, um, a month after the Congress in Dublin, um, but obviously everybody that was part of that to make that happen. Um, finally, obviously, with the, the last pieces to be put together on it, that it's pencil in the diary for May 30th, 2024, and an International Potato Day. So I just think that now, I think, caps a lot of uh, as I said, uh, brings it forward and brings us a continuum with the potato and the focus um, going forward into the future. Um, but I think it's a, a, again a congratulations to everybody that was involved in making that happen. Um, so look, my final piece now. Um, I will leave you guys just with um, to say thank you for your time again. Thank you for the WPC for this for this opportunity. Um, and I wish everyone uh, happy holidays ahead, the, being the last webinar of 2022 and the year of the Congress in Dublin. Um, again, it, it's a privilege to be able to, to be here today and, and, and to thank everyone. But I want to wish everyone a happy holidays and indeed uh, the very best uh, for a prosperous new year to come. So it, uh, this will lead now shortly into the Q&A session um, where my colleagues can take it on from there. We're open for questions. If anyone has got any kind of question that wants to raise, so we are happy to answer now or anytime during the next few days. So just let us know if you have any questions.
There's one question here about specific issues with potatoes in the cold chain. Uh, I don't know exactly which are the specific issues you are wondering, but uh, I mean, uh, I can raise, I can comment quickly. I mean, just uh, if you want something more uh, specific, I can uh, try to respond. Uh, um, basically, the cold chain is fragmented. Uh, we as three PLs have to uh, to make an integrated solution. Have to buy or with our own facilities or third party services, being a truck, being a terminal, being our cold stores, whatever, uh, to contract a solution for, for a customer. So uh, this is not easy because of course it depends on, on the trade leg. Uh, so, so if you want any more accurate response, I would be very happy to, to, to know which are your specific interests. Yeah, on temperature fluctuations. I mean, this is another another book. Uh, I'm happy to provide uh, any uh, more detailed comments on sprouts, whatever sprouting issues. I mean, was, of course, if it's not the same if it's seed potatoes or different varieties, uh, the advice on on carrying the goods in in that or the other environment. I mean, talking temperature control. Environment. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, as a general, as a general comment, I can can say uh, that not everywhere, and you may there's some allow me the word cheating on this. Not everywhere and all the time, cargo is carried at the right temperature. Of cheating or failure or call it however. Uh, I mean, you have to ensure uh, that all portions of the cold chain have got the appropriate temperature control. Uh, but I cannot be most, uh, more detailed with that unless you provide us some more uh, detailed questions. Just one there, Raphael, uh, the CIPC. Um, again, the abbreviation, I'm not sure what that is specifically. So have you got a uh, particular knowledge on that? Um, Versus CIPC is forbidden. I'm I'm not good on TLAs or four LAs, the three liters abbreviations. So just drop me uh, uh, the person who dropped that question. Please send us an email. We'll be happy to respond. I can I can comment um, on uh, there's another question about the uh, specific uh, request about uh, shipping to the to a tropical country. Well, uh, at the end, it's all about uh, having the right isolation, the right equipment, uh, if the temperature outside is high, and, and maybe tropical is not the risk. Maybe if you go to the Gulf in the Arabic country, where they are playing now the World Cup now with, I don't know how many degrees. Uh, 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 I mean, that at the end, it has to be done in a proper way and taking in consideration all temperature variations outside. I mean, the 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 temperature control environment being a container or a cold store. In a cold store, normally it's always safe. In a container, not always, because it depends on where it is stored on the ship or, or in the terminal. Uh, in some terminals, there is uh, the specific uh, professionals that are uh, knowledgeable and know that the cow has not be has not to be, even if it's plugged in, uh, sitting in the sun for longer than X or Y depending on the temperature, if it's 50 degrees in summertime in Qatar or in Dubai, of course, that's, that's of course having an impact on the, on the machine that has to work and it's, it's uh, and suffering from, from being on the, on the high side of the, uh, of the, uh, of the production of, uh, of, of, of ventilation and, and, and temperature. But, but I mean, uh, this, uh, I can, if you have a question about, um, specific country in a specific moment, I would be very happy to, to respond. More questions, uh, lots of uh, coming in. Just a further one there, Raphael, then just about, um, I guess, reefer settings, whether it should be set at continuous or stop start. Um, what are the pros and cons of each, I guess? Yeah, well, it's a very good point. 
Yeah, I mean, here, I mean, uh, it's not only temperature, but it's the ventilation as well, playing a big role, as you know, uh, especially in the case of potatoes. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, there are, I mean, when, whenever you ship deep sea, I mean, that intermittent solution, it doesn't really work. It's very complex to do it uh, while, uh, while the sea bone uh, process is going on. Uh, it can be done, but it's very complex. Uh, I. I I mean, uh, I mean, here we have two parts. We have the part of the seaboard part when it's inland. Uh, when it's inland, um, then we have the ability uh, to, to monitor what is more convenient on a case by case. Um, as a general rule, uh, I would say you have uh, to have close eyes to, to what's happening around the, I mean, if the temperature outside is going to be good, if, if, uh, if it's, if it's viable, I mean, uh, sorry to not to be more detailed, but uh, I can respond to a uh, to a detailed question. As a general rule, uh, I mean, I think I, I can. I mean, you just have to be cautious and 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 reactive uh, and proactive. I mean, react to a, a specific. I mean, uh, a case in a specific moments. Uh, if I can come to more questions. Yeah. Well, maybe, uh, yeah, here is another one. Yeah, yeah more or less it has been answered. Uh, uh, I mean, on the reefer technology, uh, there is a big change lately. I mean, on the, the shipping lines are changing uh, the container fleet uh, lately. I mean, you know, they have been making a lot of money in the post pandemic uh, sea freight war that we all have seen, and they have heavily invested in, in new equipment. Uh, they are replacing a lot of the old technologies being less environmentally friendly with new ones, which are more uh, environmentally friendly. I mean, meaning that that equipment, um, lately, uh, the new investments in, in equipment, uh, I mean, uh, the lines are doing, it's in a more efficient, uh, whenever generating the, the ventilation and, and temperature inside the container, the container flow. But, uh, and this is, I mean, I think Katarina mentioned it before on the, on the equipment imbalances and so on. I mean, in the net, uh, um, the result of these new investments and, and, and the scrapping of the old boxes is that basically, I mean, there's no extra a container fleet available, meaning that uh, the lines still have um, a situation where they cannot offer much more capacity in reefer containers. Maybe the ships are have slots, but maybe there's no equipment because the equipment is elsewhere. You have been uh, suffering as, as well of, uh, in those specific locations on equipment availability. Um, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. There are not many other questions, uh, but I would be very happy, we would be very happy to respond in Ireland, Gavin, and us here in Spain, Ekaterina and me, uh, of any other uh, points popping up. Uh, let me just uh, uh, comment that, uh, yeah, uh, we are in a situation where yeah, I could summarize where where the volumes and, and the capacities, as we mentioned before, have eased, uh, we're in a better situation to, to negotiate with shipping lines and so on. But um, the problem of the drivers in Europe and the States, availability of drivers, talking inland, uh, facilities inland, cold stores, um, all other relays when it comes to to relay from a container to a truck or from a truck to a container this the, i mean the problems would remain uh, so you just have to be cautious how how you operate and with whom you operate uh, in many countries and locations you have for sure very trustworthy and, and reasonable people working with you they may not have the the immediate solution but um, I, I think it's time to, to uh, for all of us, uh, to, to realize that uh, the situation has to be 
checked ad hoc uh, because of the dynamics of the and the changes we have every day documentary new bands new this and that and and therefore it's always as I, I said before to ask for a second opinion uh, in a logistician I mean as you when you go to the doctor and have a pain so so or a problem uh, so be be uh, we are at your disposal, and 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 if you want to write us, uh, I would drop now the email, uh, the general email of our help desk uh, um, uh, uh, email. Sorry that I'm just typing and talking for me. It's sometimes not easy. <laughs> Uh, and and we will relate it depending on the part of the world you are. If you are in Ireland, we will relate it to Gavin. If you are elsewhere, uh, uh, there will be a specific uh, specialized logistic uh, person able to assist you. So so at your disposal, and and feel free to contact us anytime. Gavin, anything else you want to say, Ekaterina? For me, I think uh, for me, I think that's fine. As you said, it, the best thing, I guess, following this now is um, I get there's a couple of questions there about anybody asking about the attendance to Australia. So I'm sure um, Nora and Ellen, um, if they're if they if they get in touch with the WPC, um, any information that's known about the uh, the Congress in Adelaide will be made available. Um, so anybody that wishes can contact the WC directly. Anything, I guess, as, as Raphael has, has laid out there, any particular questions around the logistics and the, and the supply chain and the global shipping of, uh, of uh, potatoes and indeed other products, um, happily contact us through the help desk email. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're at your disposal. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks now. <laughs>